changers, and I would like to introduce to you her oldest world changer, Alina. Um, so today I'm going to be singing um, Rescue by Lauren Daigle, and um, this is a song that like reached me, and I just could like hear God speaking it to me um, as I go through this hard season in my life, so. Alina, I think you're the bravest girl that I know. <laughs> Thank you. I 
and your mom would be proud. She's raised an awesome world changer. Thank you. I have three daughters, 17, 15, and 13 also. And um, as I was talking with them, telling them that you were going to come and that we would have a Q&A together, I asked them, I said, would you be able to do that? And they said no. <laughs> and they're, they're awesome world changers, but you are a brave girl. Thank you. Well, let's have some conversation. And is, is this the first public conversation since, is that correct, Jonathan? Yeah. Okay. So, um, it will be emotional for all of us, but it's good. We want to honor your mom. We want to honor your family. And so my prayer is that our conversation tonight would be uplifting, encouraging, challenging, and inspiring, but to honor winner and to honor your family. Um, so let's go, let's go just with the initial transition. You've recently moved from Dallas. Yes. Um, I'm an original Texan from Waco. I Texas. <laughs> we have a lot of Texans in the house. And um, so you've moved from Dallas to Nashville. How's that transition been? I believe you're playing volleyball this year. Yes. How's that going? Um, it's been a great transition, a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, we already know like a lot of people there and we have like such great family friends. And so um, the process has been a lot easier than like I imagined it definitely. Yeah, and I would just add, um, one of the things you need to know, we actually had... Um, Let's introduce you, Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, this is uh, Jonathan, Alina's dad, Winter's husband, and they years. have four, four daughters. Is it daughter twins? Alina, 14. Okay. Caitlin, 11, almost 12. And then twins, and Cameron then the twins. and Olivia, okay. nine. Yeah. But one of the things I just want to share with you, uh, just God's intentionality in this whole thing. Uh, I, you know, I don't understand why my wife's not here right now, why she couldn't speak on the stage. But in all that he's been doing, he's shown us kind of his, uh, his providence, his hand in the glove of history, as I've heard it spoke before. But this reality, we actually had planned to move to Nashville. I was working for a guy named Tony Evans. Many of you may know him from radio. But um, <laughs> Tony Evans gets a hand clap. Go ahead. <laughs> You know, I ran his ministry for about seven years, and uh, we had made a decision um, to go to Nashville, and I was taking a role as an executive pastor. We bought our house on July 6th, moved in July 9th. We had left for, from Nashville for two weeks and um, went on vacation for a week in Iowa, went to Dallas for a week for me to finish up my role, and Winter was actually working on her last book, actually called I'm Yours, a prayer book for girls. And uh, she would pass away suddenly uh, there in Dallas, but God had already started us on this journey of going to Nashville. And Alina said to me, probably three days after Winter passed away, she said, Daddy, are we still going to Nashville? And I was like, well, I was trying to be spiritual dad. Like, we need to pray about it and talk as a family and all those things. And I was serious about that. And she just looked at me and she said, Daddy, Mommy was more excited than anybody about your new role and us going to Nashville. And um, so we just, I, I basically got schooled by a 14-year-old and God had already lit that path. And so we just, kept walking the path, I started speaking as if um, to my other girls, and they were all like, they already assumed we were going. So it's been a neat journey because I've, we've watched God just open door after door, um, just showing us his love all along the way. So, Elena, how did you discover your um, love for music? How did you get started singing? And, and how has that been a way that you can process life, emotions, what you're going through? Um, so I probably discovered my like love for singing when, okay, my 13th birthday I was invited, well I wasn't invited, but my uncle surprised me um, with a trip to the studio and I got to like do a, my own re rendition of the song Hollow by Tori Kelly. And so that's probably when I first realized like I really enjoy this and like it's a way for me to like, I guess get my emotions out because um, I'm a very inner person, like I don't let anything out. And so music has definitely been a way for me to um, just like let out my feelings and really tell people how I feel. And so it's also been a way for me to like impact other people too. And so this whole singing journey has been neat to see like God has used my brokenness to like impact others and like who would have thought it would be in this way, but it is. Um, and so I'm making the most of it. And the way I do that is through music and I just I love music, it's great. Well, watching the video of your mom 
Um, she obviously was extremely um, passionate and intentional about you and your sisters. Um, she understood who she was in Christ as a daughter of the King. How would you describe your mom? Maybe like three words that come to mind when you think of your mother. <laughs> so when I first looked at the questions earlier today, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? Like, there's so many different words. And so when I was sitting there, I just realized like, if she was sitting there, she would just be so like peaceful. And so one word is peaceful, um, another is content. She was always just okay with what was happening. Um, and third would be abundant, um, just in everything. She was extremely abundant in her love and her giving, and then also like what God blessed her with. And so those are probably my three words. Jonathan, what about you? Yeah, I would just add one word, and I, I think a lot of times people can look at somebody on like a screen like that or on a stage and just assume like they're like this superwoman. In a lot of ways, she was. She was my Proverbs 31 woman, but there's a reality of Windsor like operated. If you, if anybody, maybe a few of you might have seen the funeral, but she operated from a place of like just rest. And you know, her cousin who did her eulogy just choked and said, "I've never met anybody that watched as much Netflix." Um, and took as many naps that, that, that could be as productive as you've been. And she really did, she really, she did watch a lot of Netflix. Um, but she operated from a place of rest, and because she did that, and because she was secure in who she was, she was able to say no to a lot of other things that she could be doing, just because it's the pressure from this person or the world or whatever. So she really, um, she's just very restful, and God just, just used that. So I would just add that. A very, I mean, peaceable was probably the right word. Um, but she wasn't like this superhuman. She just knew that what she was called to do and didn't just stayed away from the rest of it. It was really neat to watch. Learned a lot from her in that. Which is a lesson that we can all learn about operating in our own space of who God's created us to be, not trying to be like someone else and copying, but resting in who we are in Christ. Um, Alina, what are some ways that you found that your mom was intentional in investing in who you are today? Um, I would probably say the biggest way is she was honest and she would, um, she was honest and she was vulnerable. And so when I was going through things that she had gone through um, or I made decisions that she has made, not that I'm a bad person guys, but you know, I'm a teenager. And so when I would talk back or things like that, she would always um, punish me, but she would also be very vulnerable and honest and like, let me know that it's not, like it's not just me, you know, like she's done it too. She's gone through the same things and so, just having someone um, there that was my authority, but could also be like my best friend. Um, I love that. And so um, just getting to be her best friend along with her mom, along with my mom, she was, um, that was my favorite part, getting to have that like special relationship. Um, she was probably my closest friend. So. Yeah, I would uh, just add to that, the uh, book that you referenced, um, it was really about intentional parenting and us just being intentional parents with our girls. We've we wrote it from a perspective of um, parents. It was from a series of prayers we did for our daughters. And we talked about intentionality in three different areas. And one was just um, being intentional in our relationship with God and the reality that as women, as moms, as dads, a couple of us in the room, um, there's just this reality that to the degree that we actually grow in our relationship to, with God is to the degree that we can actually train our children to do the same because we can teach what we know, but we, we reproduce who we are. And uh, so that was a big deal for us, just being um, just intentional in our relationship with God, uh, which Winter was very intentional in her relationship with the Lord. Um, also, her, uh, our relationship um, with our children, like having a relationship. You know, one of the neat things for me uh, in this whole deal, and this isn't about me, this is about Winter, but one of the neat things about me in this whole deal is that um, because I was intentional in getting to know my girls, um, I can now not have to figure out how do I get to know my 14 year old daughter. I have a really good relationship with her. And that's one of the things I would, that's the, the beautiful thing with winter as well. Like with all of our girls, like I can say even my nine year old girls that she raised to nine, they know who they are in Christ and they know who she was. They just have this, they had this great relationship because she was intentional about just getting down on her knees and being in their face, in their eyes. I mean, she was a prolific writer, but she spent a ton of time with our girls in their faces, in their space. Um, and then the third thing was just intentional, intentionality with the world around us. And I love what Gabe was talking about tonight, because that's really what he was talking about, that if we're not engaging in the, with the world around us, um, then, you know, one, we're not having impact. But the, we, we can only do that if we know who we are in Christ. Um, and that impact's only going to be strong and, um, and be well-received if we're actually doing it from a place of relationship. Um, so just intentionality. She was very intentional in those three areas and, and probably led, I would say, in the creation of that book and those ideas. Um, and she lived it. 
going a little bit deeper into that, um, you know, my heart and my passion is to be intentional in our parenting. But like Gabe referenced, in order to know truth, um, in order to impart truth, you have to know truth. And in order to, the example he used about counterfeit, you have to study truth. And so we as parents need to be intentional in our relationship with Jesus as we're then intentional in passing that on to our children. So can either of you think of particular ways or areas that practically, you're talking to a group of moms and, and um, they're always looking for the practical tips of, but what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Or what does that look like of how I can learn and take that home and implement it? Are there ways that you had um, with your mom and dad or ways that you recall of that you were intentional to really invest spiritually and practically, how did that play out in your home? Um, of course, just, you know, reading the Bible to me and teaching me um, truth and what it is and um, about God. But I can't help but just think, like, she did the silly stuff with me. Like, we would take naps. We're, like, the same person. And so our thing would be taking naps, and that was, like, I could say that was her being intentional because she knew, like, what turned me on, what turned her on was, like, the same thing. So it was kind of easy. Um, but just, like, doing the things with your daughter that she likes, I guess, um, and I feel like a lot of times, a lot of my friends are always, you know, wondering like why they're not as close to their moms. And I just wish like their moms knew what they liked and like what turned them on, what made them happy. And so for me, it's naps and Netflix and things like that. And so me and my mom did that together 24 seven. And so that's probably my favorite. 23 seven, how about 23 seven, yeah, 23 <laughs> seven. Um, I would say two things. Uh, one of the things, I just drew a blank, so I'll go to the other one. One of the things that Winter taught me to do that I now do with my girls, um, I actually journal with Winter. I write to her every day right now, which is really therapeutic for me. But one of the things she taught me probably four years ago was journaling um, with my girls. So she would get a journal and she would write to one of our daughters or all of them, and then she'd tuck that journal under their pillow. And they might find it that next morning or they might find it the next day or whenever, but then they would just write right back to her. And it wasn't just like, it was spiritual stuff sometimes, but sometimes it was just silly girl stuff, and sometimes it was, you know, more serious girl stuff. And it, so I've actually been doing that with my girls, and uh, I, I think that's the, probably the most practical thing that you can do to engage your children and, and allow them to be free to just say what they want to say, you know, and share. So, and even like to the point now with like my 14-year-old, like sometimes like she's schooling me in her journal. I'm like, all right, little girl, let's relax now. No, but it's good. Um, the other thing. I'm going to have to come back to it because I totally forgot it, but it was really important. So I'll come back to it, even if it means another question. Feel free to interrupt any time. Um, Alino, do you recall a specific time where you made your faith your own versus what was taught to you? So having grown up in a Christian home, then at what point or what did it look like when you owned it for yourself? Because as a 14-year-old, you're incredibly mature and you know who you are, and so that foundation is there. So is, has there been a particular moment when you feel like that you owned understanding your relationship with Jesus? Um, I feel like there's been a lot of moments. I'm kind of like this. Um, so I feel like a lot of my life, I was very dependent on my parents' faith and just, you like you get caught in the cycle of like going to church on Sunday and you know, saying the right things. And so I feel like after being in the movie War Room, I was, I kind of was forced to step into the role of like, I guess sort of leadership. And so like knowing what I believed was serious um, because you would be on the red carpet and they would question you and things like that. And so I really had to know like what I believed and like why I believed it. And so um, I really didn't step into that role or like really know, I guess who I was in Christ until after that movie, um, just because um, I had to live it out. And so, now, like, being in interviews and stuff, I'm not just, like, saying it. I feel like I'm, I, like, live it. And so I'm um, just feeling the difference between saying it and living it. It's, like, it's a big deal. I remember, like, an exact moment when she was, I think she was 10. It was probably right after. She was in the movie War Room. I don't, she just kind of glossed over it. But she was 10 years old. Um, and uh, I think it was the summer after she was on set. And I just remember, because sometimes it's, like all we can do is expose our kids, expose our kids. So Winter and I were intentional about exposing our kids to truth, God's word at home, dinner table, like whenever we can, even to the point of sometimes Winter was rolling her eyes because I'm just reading too much or going too deep or whatever. But I remember being in a church service at the church that we attended in Dallas. And um, I just remember the Holy Spirit, like just grabbing her heart. 
And we couldn't do that. We couldn't fabricate that. Um, and I would just say, like, prayer was another intentional thing that Winter did. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's been fun to kind of, um, I don't know if she's mad at me for this, but I've been going through some of her prayer journals, and she just would journal and journal and journal, and she's writing about her girls, and she's writing about her marriage, and she's just writing about whatever. And that wasn't anything we did other than pray. I mean, I think Gabe was talking about, like, prayer. People don't think, <laughs> you know, pray for Paris and all that. I mean, there's a reality that prayer works, and we've watched it work in the life of our girls, you know, being the first and then all, all four of them. And I've had the opportunity to baptize each of them, and knowing that their faith is their own um, is a big deal, but we didn't fabricate that. God did it. Holy Spirit did it. We just laid it out there. I always say my testimony is I've tasted and seen that God is good, and I think that's the best thing that we can do for our children is just, like, load them up with as much nutrition as we can. It's like, you know, we let our kids eat junk food. They're going to like junk food, but I think the more we train our kids to eat actually good food, the junk food just starts not tasting as good, um, and that's my hope. I, th I think that's what we try to do with our girls, and it seems to be working. I don't know. We'll see. Just kidding. It's worked realistically and spiritually, like how junk food doesn't taste good. <laughs> That's only for her. My other three girls love junk food. Do you know what you want to do when you grow up? Do you have any burning passions? Um, no. Obviously, I would love to sing. Um, I always say I just want to get paid to travel the world. That would be so fun. So. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> I think my daughter, that's her goal too, so maybe y'all can conspire together and come up with something. Well, Alina, um, I'm going to uh, read something and reference something, but one of the things that um, before your dad and I talked about you coming, um, after your mom passed away, I was reading one of your Instagram posts, and whenever I read it, that was the first moment that I was like, wow. Um, it's not just, you know, um, the books and the speaking, but there's proof of the world changer that um, is in the home. And, um, and then it was um, then in conversations later that actually your dad offered if, if um, I wanted you to come, and and I'd prayed about that actually the day before, but I didn't want to ask um, because I didn't want to be insensitive, and so um, I took that as a huge confirmation from the Lord that you were supposed to be here tonight. So first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. But I want, I'm going to read a little excerpt. This is the day after your mom passed away. The nurse walking you down the hall said, I'm going to tell you something I need you to never forget, okay? You serve a big God, a big God. Don't you ever forget that. Alina speaking, I serve a big God. Obstacles will be thrown at me, but my God is still there. He knows what he's doing and he's got a plan. I say this not by sheer will, but through faith. In the moment, his plan may seem outrageous and I may not understand. I continue to ask myself, why me? Why did he choose my family? But I'm reminded he's in control. So even as I weep and I grieve, I can smile with joy because I'll see her again. Alina, how have you been able to process grief and pain while simultaneously knowing the sovereignty of God? and knowing and believing that God is good and God is good all the time, even in the midst of pain? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, some days I would like fully live that and some days I like don't believe it at all. Um, but definitely like just watching my dad's faith um, and how like joyful he's been through it all. It's okay. Has helped me like really, I guess like stick to my faith and like understand that God's in control. Um, so just through God's strength, like I have no control over the, like that at all. Um, and sometimes it is crazy. Like I can't believe that I still like love God sometimes. Like why, why do I? Um, so like his presence is really near and I can sense like his strength in me. Um, so it's not me, it's God. I would, uh. I'm really proud of this girl and all my girls, actually. Um, but one of the things I'm really that I, I, I watched her do because she's, you know, she's a, 
She's a very emotional person. She actually, I'm surprised she's crying right now because she's pretty, like, she can be very just on and not, not be emotional. But uh, as I've watched her be up and down and just experience life in high highs and low lows, I've watched her consistently go back to truth and cons consistently go back to God's word. So if you look, if you were to look at Alina's bed over top of her wall, are all these artistic, she's really artistic. So she's got these beautiful, like, handwritten, I don't even know what you call them, but like these, it's just all these words of truth just over her bed. And I think the only thing that's carrying her through right now, and I think the only thing carrying our family through right now is just knowing God's truth. I don't know what you do in this situation if you don't know God's truth. Like if I don't know my wife is in a better place than where she was when she was here, Amen. then what do I have? Amen. If I don't trust that God is good, then what do I have? And so um, anyway, like just continually going back to truth, and I've watched her do it and live it out, and I'm proud of her for it. What would you say to, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, like I mentioned earlier, um, the whole reason that I started Passion for Moms was wanting to raise godly world changers, wanting to encourage and equip other moms to be intentional, that God has given us this authority. God's given us the blessing of enjoying life and investing in life. And you have a room full of moms that have children, sons and daughters, and, and some of those children may not have a relationship with Jesus. Um, others may be struggling. We saw what your mom had to say and how she would um, encourage moms, what would you have to say to a room full of moms as a 14 year old about what are some of the most important things that we can do in raising world changers and in investing in um, each one of our children, how to make you feel special, how to teach you God's truth? What are some, what would you say to moms um, definitely just lead by example. One thing my parents um, never fail to do is like when they mess up, they always come back and like apologize and let me know like that wasn't how um, they should have re responded or acted. And so I can like see myself now when I mess up, like I'm constantly apologizing to my sisters and like, um, so just their example has really, I don't know, it's just like really impacted me. Um, and I have learned like, you can't force it. Like, I've even tried, like, forcing God on my sisters. Um, I'm a very forceful person, and I'm like, you need to believe this so I can see you in heaven. And so, <laughs> and so um, just knowing that, like, I can't force it on them, and the more that I try to force it on them, and the more that I go against, like, what I'm saying um, by example, the more they're, like, not going to believe it. And so just example and, like, living it out. Um, because, like, even when you don't think your teenager's watching, we're always watching you guys. Um, even though we act like we're not watching you guys, we watch you guys. And so, um, yeah, so just lead by example. I would just say, uh, I'm kind of reminded, my college roommate and best friend is in the room right now. And um, he told me, uh, he read our book, like, on the flight to the funeral. And um, in the beginning of the book, we talk about having, like, this five-year plan. Like, Winter wanted to be, like, a coffee barista in Italy. That was, like, her, <laughs> her life goal. And then she met me, and I, I ruined that. But um, we met, like, right after college. And um, we talked about having a five-year plan, but we literally had Alina like 11 months after we got married. And we had, you know, child after child after child. And I think the reason we had a five-year plan and we didn't want to have children right away is because we thought that God had all these other blessings stored up for us and travel and all these things that the world thinks are really, really sexy and cool. And it's not that they aren't. Travel is amazing and all those things are amazing. But we forget that children are a blessing from the Lord and the greatest blessing we could ever have. And the only thing that we'll ever invest in that will keep like in reinvesting itself Amen. in things beyond our lives. And um, he, he said to me, Jeff, who's here, he said, what if you, like, what if you would have executed your five-year plan? Like, you wouldn't be where you are right now. And I think a lot of times, we, oftentimes we want to kind of get our kids out of the way so we can go achieve whatever that next thing is. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I'm just really grateful that we spent a lot of time, like, investing in our girls. And we had no idea, like, Winter had no idea how much time she'd have with them. Even to the point, so our 11-year-old is sandwiched between Alina, who had like this big old career at age 10, and then our twins who came, I mean, they came and everything stopped. So our, our Caitlin, our 11-year-old, 
just didn't have a lot of time um, with her mom. And Winter always kind of felt bad about that. So she heard God tell her last September, I want you to homeschool Caitlin. Mm. And I tried to talk her out of homeschooling Caitlin. I'm like, you are not a homeschool mom. You have, <laughs> you have three books due in the next eight months or whatever the number was. Like she had all this stuff. And she was adamant about hearing God's voice and executing what God told her to do, which was to homeschool Caitlin. So in January, we went and met with her teacher and said, hey, we're thinking about pulling her out of school and homeschooling her. And her teacher said, godly, godly response. You will never regret spending more time with your child and do it. And she was the best Amen. teacher in school. So winter homeschooled Caitlin from January until June. And Caitlin got to spend amazing time with her mom. And what's funny is homeschooling wasn't like, I mean, they did homework and schoolwork and all that, but like, no, they, they would go to the nail salon together. <laughs> <laughs> she would go to meetings with Winter. I mean, it was just like, it was a really neat time, but like she was just obedient, just to own whatever God was calling her to do and to listen for his voice and to do it. Um, and that's a big deal. So just intentionally invest in your kids, never knowing, not knowing how much time you have with them, because we never do, so. I think that's the thing that's most impactful, um, especially as a mom, when you have someone else um, similar to your same age that um, passes away early. And it's a reminder for each one of us that we are not promised tomorrow. And so for us to do that all God's calling us to do today um, and to be um, intentional in, in raising up godly, godly children. Alina, do you have any final words of exhortation? Um, no. Thank you guys for having me. This was a lot of fun. Um, I'm glad I got to come. There's, Jonathan, before you leave, there's, there's one thing that I um, just um, feel led to do, and I'm going to solicit Jimmy and Gabe's help, if you don't mind. This is totally spur of the moment. Alina, if you'll come back up here, um, like we referenced, this is the this is the first time that um, Alina and Jonathan have spoken publicly since Winter passed away eight weeks ago. But you know what? I know that this is the first of many. You have a multitude ahead of you, and Alina, you are a world changer, and you are a light. Your sisters are world changers, and God has his hand on you. He's going to do extraordinary things through your family. He already has. And because this is kind of the first night, I just feel led that we lay hands on you and we commission you forward in the name of Jesus for all that he has for you. So Gabe and Jimmy, will you um, pray over them? Jesus, we are just overwhelmed again by your greatness, your goodness, your faithfulness to this family and their response to you. Lord, we celebrate their response to you, to behold you in the midst of the pain, in the midst of their cross, they have found you once again to be richer and deeper and wider and more faithful. And I couldn't help but uh, just thinking, listening to you guys tonight, just uh, kept seeing a picture of a huge open gate, an open door. Uh, first, speaking of the throne room of God, there's just an open door because of the blood of Jesus for you to receive mercy and help. But there's also an open gate now to shine and to reflect his glory like never before. Like never before, the gate is open to reflect the glory of Jesus to people that are so desperate and so needy to see something real and authentic. And so I agree tonight, we just commission our friends, our new friends, we commission them in uh, to this work of receiving mercy and grace and giving mercy and grace. Thank you, Lord, that there will always be enough for them. There will always be enough, and as we lay hands on them, we pray. God, may tonight be one of those marking places, one of those before and after moments where your presence increases at such a level that they just can't help but be overcome with your goodness. And so we bless them tonight. Father, we just thank you for the wisdom that we just can't believe we're hearing from a young woman, from her father who'd gone through one of the most difficult moments in their life. God, the power of your faithfulness shines through. And God has encouraged my heart tonight 
I know it's encouraged every single person in this room who can just hear of your faithfulness in the most dire of circumstances, God. And so I pray that you'll empower and encourage Jonathan and Alina tonight. God, encourage them that they made the right decision to come talk about this. That as hard as this was to walk through tonight for the first time, God, that these tears you're going to turn into joy, that these tears you're going to move in other people's lives, you're going to um, plant new things that are going to come from, from their yeah. willingness to talk openly and honestly about the pain, about the struggle, about the doubts, about the fears. So God, I just thank you for their witness. I thank you for their testimony because we know that it's their testimony that defeats the enemy. It's the words of our testimony, God, that defeat the enemy. And tonight the enemy's defeated when he hears the strength of how you've shown up in the lives of those who trust you. So may this go forward. Mm -hmm. May this go yes. forward far and wide, God. May you just give them open doors and opportunities and give them discernment of what the doors in which they're going to walk through. But God, we thank you for their faithfulness for each of us.